Okay, we're ready for the next use, which is Huntington National Bank. Yeah, that bank. <laughs> of course, as we might as we didn't use that. Uh, are uh, both sides ready to proceed? Sure. You each will have 15 minutes, and the appellant may reserve up to five minutes. like to reserve maybe three minutes. That's please. fine. My hearing might be a little off today, so I'm going to apologize in advance. I'll try to speak up. I sometimes get really soft. Thank you. But I'll pretend you're my child or something, and I can talk really loudly then. Is that better? Yes, okay. that's good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. This is an unusual case from my perspective. I've practiced law for 26 years. I've been very involved in the number of foreclosure cases for the last 20 years in various courts. This is the one case that nothing seemed to work from the defendant's perspective and the home buyer. That's why we're here today. This started out as a commercial loan to two companies. The two companies, Valley City Electric and High Tech Electric, provided electrical contracting services for primarily new school construction. As part of several big jobs, they took out loans with Huntington Bank, or a loan, for a million dollars or so. That was guaranteed by Melissa Weedmeyer and Tom Weedmeyer, father and daughter. Tom was the one running the companies. Melissa was the title owner of the home. He had nothing to do with the companies other than being the shareholder or member. Um, there were a lot of delays with these jobs. Unfortunately, the electrical workers tend to be the last ones paid in construction jobs, and their schedules are very much at the mercy of all of the other contractors. That's what happened here. They got very delayed. At one point, they were almost two or three million dollars behind. The money from Huntington was used to fund those jobs and to keep things going in anticipation of them. When the jobs got way behind, uh, that loan was not able to be paid, and it was very difficult. At one point, after the jobs were finished, there were three unpaid jobs, and apparently none of the parties thought there was any value remaining. However, there is an agreement reached for uh, mediation to be pursued by Valley City and High Tech Electric with the three different school districts. And during that time, Huntington agreed to accept just interest payments. And then that mediation, there was a change in attorneys, and there was a lot of activity on one of the jobs after being told by prior counsel that none of these jobs had any value. New attorney got involved, immediately got one of the jobs settled. That may have soured the relationship to a large degree between Huntington and the borrowers. Ultimately, Melissa Weidmeyer had to file Chapter 7 because one of the creditors, a bonding company, that had paid or about $750,000 on the jobs, ended up um, taking a consent judgment, and they were garnishing their wages, so the Chapter 7 was filed. Initially, the plan had been to file the Chapter 7 for Melissa to discharge the debt, and then to either approach Huntington to try to redo or modify the loan, and if that was unsuccessful, to file a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. If that happened, we wouldn't be here today, and the whole Weedmeyer family would be back in the home. Unfortunately, in her case, the U.S. trustee objected to her getting a discharge. That delayed the discharge being issued in the 7, which precluded a Chapter 11 being filed. We filed a motion to dismiss the U.S. trustee complaint, which was successful, but meantime, the home was coming up for sheriff sale. It moved extremely quickly. I've never seen ever for a 
foreclosure process moved this quickly. We were negotiating with Huntington to try to save the home. I'm not making any representations that Huntington made any promises to hold off on doing anything, but ultimately when we didn't hear anything from Huntington, we were concerned and filed a motion to stay the sheriff's sale at that same date, April 15th of 2015, there had been a, an appraisal that was filed. We were not able to stay the sale, and ultimately the sale was held May 21st, just five, five and a half weeks after the appraisal was actually uh, filed. We filed an objection to confirmation, provided detailed affidavit as to why we believed that the process was problematic and the court did not hold a hearing. It did not give any ruling other than it took Huntington Bank's proposed order that they submitted to the court at the time they filed the motion to confirm the sale and simply signed it. But someone, presumably the magistrate or judge, made a handwritten notation that all motions not ruled upon or denied. There were a lot of very small aspects that seemed to be out of compliance with the, uh, with the share of sale provisions. Most of those by themselves would not be very significant. I hate to put it like this, but no harm, no foul. Here, when you look at the big picture, and I realize that it's an abuse of discretion standard that has to be applied, and that's not the easiest burden for an appellant to overcome, but the case law does indicate that that abuse of discretion must be viewed in conjunction with all the facts of the case. And that's why we brought up the fact that the motion to stay the sale and to go to mediation was denied. I've never in 26 years had a court deny both an objection to confirmation and or a motion for mediation even when they're filed as they usually are well past the date that a foreclosure judgment was issued. Um, there have been, as, as this court well knows and everyone in this courtroom, a lot of foreclosures and there were a lot of burdens on the courts and it seems things have been moved along fairly quickly. But this is a very important case. Huntington is a very large bank. They're owed approximately a million dollars or were owed maybe a little over a million before that sheriff's sale. And they're very concerned with this. You can imagine a bank with 71 billion in assets that's very concerned over a million dollars, how much more the homeowners with multiple family members living in that home and conducting a business would be concerned. To that point, um, after reading your brief, I was surprised um, to read in uh, the bank's brief sort of some of the facts that were not. Um, I was surprised to read, after reading your brief, to your point about uh, your client's concern that a motion for summary judgment was filed by the bank, which was unopposed by your client, that your client didn't um, respond to even the motion to confirm, did not oppose the motion for confirmation. So I appreciate what you're saying about the concern, but it does not appear that it was showing up in terms of um, filing and defending before the trial court. I see your point, Your Honor, and I'll say with my own practice and what I've observed in many cases, there usually is not a dispute as to how much money is actually owed, which is why I don't generally oppose those unless there's a pretty good counterclaim, and that the counterclaims do not exist in too many cases. So there was a reason not to just file an objection to the summary judgment motion for the sake of it. There was really no basis since we were not disputing the balance that was owed. And also I believe Huntington made a point to 
argue that when Huntington filed a motion for relief from the bankruptcy stay, there is no opposition. Again, in a Chapter 7, it's extremely unlikely to do that. The only time that I've personally seen a bankruptcy judge entertain such a motion would be if a payment had been tendered to the bank and the bank had refused to accept it or there had been some agreement that was not complied with. It, with most of these cases, at least my experience for whatever it's worth, the goal is to try to either get refinancing, to try to get income from other jobs or things like that, and then to try to negotiate with the bank so that the property can be saved. And most of the time, that can start early on. I inherited this case a little bit later into the process, but I was involved, I believe, well in advance of the summary judgment motion. So that's why there was not a lot of activity on the defendant's part until after there was relief from stay and it appeared that the sale was going to be scheduled. And that was really the concern. It appears that motions to stay sheriff sales are very common. I have seen many. The uh, clerk from Edina County obviously has a separate filing fee for them of $600, which is fairly substantial. I believe that would be in anticipation that people will file motions to try to stay the sales. But at this point, I would just like to state that overall, there were a lot of technicalities, and I hate using that word, that do not seem to be complied with. I put those in the brief, and again, taken individually, it's probably not harmful. But if you're stepping from the outside and you see how quickly this case moved, how the bank would not accept or consider any type of modification to the loan, and apparently felt so strongly that they would not collect any money that they let this house go for just barely over the minimum bid with $600,000 left, there just seems to be a, a problem with it. And again, those individual points were detailed, but I would state that under the facts of this case, it was an abuse of discretion for the trial court to deny the motion or objection to confirmation, and especially not to at least hold a hearing to try to sort through all these different issues. All right, you, you're in your rebuttal time. Thank you. Thank you. Side, uh, counsel's uh, personal testimonials in this case, the process that was followed with respect to the notes, the foreclosure, the judgment on the notes, the sale was all perfectly regular. No substantive right of the appellate was infringed upon. Uh, the most, the largest technicality in this case that shouldn't be a shouldn't be overlooked is that the bank loaned over one million dollars to the owners of these two companies with the promise that there would that they would be repaid and as security for that they voluntarily signed the guarantees and the mortgages and that was the basis of the rights when they for when they failed to fulfill their promises uh, so uh, we think the process was perfectly correct uh, we think that we're miles from anything that approaches an abuse of discretion in the way this case was handled. I think the judge made a very good point here, is that from the filing of the note on the guarantee, through the judgment on the note, through the filing for the foreclosure, for the order in foreclosures, they filed their bankruptcy. I don't know what strategy they were filing, but it stayed the proceedings for a while. We filed a motion for relief from stay. <clears throat> The trustee abandoned the property that's subject to the guarantees. Not one word from the appellant in this case. Didn't file anything until the order for sale, and then they filed a motion to stay, which was overruled by the judge. 
they did attempt to file an objections to that overruling, and the court found two things. One, they found that the objections to the motion is to the order denying the stay was late. They didn't file it within the specified time. And then the court went on to analyze the reasons they gave and found them all insufficient anyway. And the reason why I mention the motion to stay because it's featured quite a bit in the, in the appellant's brief. But if you look at the three assignments of error, none of the assignments of error address the appropriateness of the, grant, of the denial of the motion for stay. All three assignment of errors deal with the denial, uh, denial of their objections to the motion to confirm. Uh, and all of the things that they raise have nothing to do with the process of the sale. They talk about also everything else except the sale. And the reason is, is because the sale was appropriate. You know, the technical violations, again, not one of them uh, invoked any substantive right if we tick through them. You know, uh, they say it was too quick. We've heard that. Well, you know, the Ohio statute, 2329.26, says it has to be advertised for three consecutive weeks. It was. All right? There's no issue there. Uh, now, the, the form notice that the sheriff filed uh, said it was advertised for three weeks and that the sale will occur within 30 days. It occurred within 24. But the notice filed by the sheriff attesting to the statutory requirement doesn't change the statutory requirement. The statute says it's got to be advertised for three consecutive weeks. It was. That was satisfied. That's not fast. That's what the statute says. They may not like it, but that's what the statute says. And incidentally, as an aside, you know, this case started back in December of 2013. The bank didn't think this process went fast. Uh, so what else do they complain about? They complain about local rule 12B, <clears throat> that uh, <clears throat> the bank didn't provide the prosecutor within seven days of the order uh, confirming sale. Well, yes, we did. If you look at the record, it's TB69. The prosecutor received the proper notice within the proper time. And incidentally, and this is sort of reflective of the kinds of <coughs> uh, technicalities <coughs> that they complain about, even had it been true that the prosecutor didn't get the this notice of the plan of the uh, proposed order within seven days, that rule isn't for the benefit of the debtor. That rule is for the benefit of the county so that the, the prosecutor can review the order and make sure that the order is satisfactory to the county and that the taxes were, were properly uh, allocated. What else did they complain about? Uh, local Rule 12D wasn't satisfied uh, because the purchase price was supposed to be paid in 30 days and it wasn't. <clears throat> uh, well, all right, that's true. The buyer didn't pay the balance, but there, were some, there was a motion filed which might have caused the the buyer to delay a little bit but the rule also specifies the remedy it says if the buyer doesn't pay the court has the authority to issue contempt again that's not for the protection of the of the debtor that's for the protection of the bank and the rule specifies the remedy the remedy isn't we overturn the sale right which is confirmed and their motion was out of rule anyway what else do they complain about they complain that uh, 2329.271 wasn't satisfied this is, the, this is the statute that says when the buyers buy the property, they fill out a form that says if they're going to occupy it. Yes, they, apparently when they filled out that form, they said they weren't going to occupy it, then they did. All right? Uh, what substantive right of the debtor does that invoke? It doesn't invoke any. And the purpose of that, of that statute, and it's in, the, it's in the statutory history, and we referenced it, is again for the protection of the county, so that the county knows who to send notices to. If they're going to occupy the property, they know that they can send notices there. Um, now, there's another rule that they complained about, 2329.32a. They said that's the rule, the statutory rule, that says the order confirming the sale uh, has to be confirmed within 30 days after the sale. It was a little after that. But that's the court's schedule, not ours. And the debtor is benefited by that short delay because they get to stay in the property a little bit longer. So again, no substantive rights were uh, were invoked and there was no harm other than the harm that, granted, uh, you lose your property, but that's the deal they made. 
they accepted the million dollars, they provided security when they defaulted, that's what happens. The lender is going to foreclose on its security. That's what makes our economy work. That's what encourages banks to loan money. Uh, and the bank wasn't an investor in this business. I don't know what contracts they had, what contracts they didn't. Certainly they assumed that by investing their own money in their capital in that company or those companies that they were going to earn money. The bank wasn't going to share in their profits. All the bank wanted was its loan to, re to be repaid. And it wanted to be able to foreclose on the security in the unhappy event that it was uh, that it wasn't paid. Um, they complained that the motion to confirm didn't uh, specify the amount to be paid to the bank. Well, when there's no authority, there's no requirement that that be the case. And the confirmation order does say what the amount of the, of the what, you know, it's $465,000 and some change, and it specifies the, the deductions. Well, I think we can do simple math and come up, if, if it's important to know at that particular point, putting aside interest, which is accumulating, we can determine the, uh, the deficiency that way. Uh, there's talk about, there's a lot of talk about the eviction and no hearing. Well, there is no specific requirement that a tenant on a property uh, receive a hearing, particularly in this case, because one, they produced, you know, th from the time this case started in December of 2013, up until a day before the sale, we didn't know, bank didn't know about a lease. They produced it the day before the sale, right? And the important point about the lease is it was never recorded. Well, if you have an unrecorded lease, what that creates is a private interest in the property, not a public one. And the private interest gives you rights against the landlord, but not against the world. That's the purpose of the recording statute. And the court's own local rules on the foreclosures say that you have to give notice, right? And you have to name all the parties of record. That's what the preliminary judicial report is for. They didn't show up because they never filed the, the, the lease. If they don't file the lease, you're not a necessary party. And that's what the cases say. So that argument uh, goes nowhere. Uh, there's also, of course, Liz Pendens, because even if we accept the fact that they published the lease the day before the sale, our mortgage, the bank's mortgage, had been filed you know, way back in the foreclosure. It started in 2014, so they're barred by Liz Pendens. <coughs> Uh, in any in any case, um, also there's an argument in there that the uh, motion to confirm sale should have been denied because uh, they didn't have the opportunity for redemption. Well, if they had redeemed, which means you pay off all the leads, the bank would have been very happy. Uh, they never got anything from the appellant except promises to pay, never cash on the barrel head. Their second assignment of error says the court erred because it confirmed the sale uh, without having a hearing. Again, there's no specific requirement in the statute that a hearing be held to confirm the sale. Uh, the Gaddis case certainly doesn't support that. It says uh, uh, you know, no evidentiary issues uh, were raised. The court uh, uh, considered their objections and overruled them. The overruling, particularly on the basis that they suggested, as I said, is or suggested is far from anything that approaches a an abuse of discretion. And again, all they really did when they went to object to the order to confirm the the sale was to regurgitate all the arguments that they made, in which the court had previously rejected on uh, the confirmation on the motion to stay the sale. So it was the same stuff over and over again, and none of it had had anything to do with the process. Uh, that the court actually, or that the county used to actually sell the property. So no issues that were raised that required any kind of evidentiary hearing. No substantive uh, rights were invoked. Uh, they raised in the motion to stay, in the motion to confirm, and again, the, the same old arguments that the, the trial court object, uh, rejected, and we think it was perfectly appropriate. Uh, in our view, there were absolutely no irregularities associated with this with this process. Uh, and I think that sums up where the, uh, I, th I suppose the only other argument that they made that I didn't specifically address, again, it, had, it came up in the context of the motion to stay 
the sale, which we think isn't even before this court, but they made this argument that uh, after a year and a half and after their bankruptcy uh, gambit failed, well, then they approached the bank and they wanted to offer a compromise and the bank didn't, didn't accept it and proceeded to follow its contractual rights. Uh, and they cite the Little John case, saying that the bank had some sort of implied duty of good faith and fair dealing. And uh, while we agree that uh, there is an implied duty of good faith and fair dealing in, implied in every contract, first, that duty arises only when the contract is signed as to a term. When the parties enter into a contract and they omit a term or they just don't think of something, normally the implied duty of good faith and fair dealing is then invoked to say, all right, the parties have a duty of good faith towards one another and they have to work toward together cooperatively to achieve the common goal. That really doesn't apply because there were no unspoken terms. We had, we had negotiated the deal and they were following through with it. So I think as a threshold matter, the implied duty of good faith and fair dealing never arises in this case. And second, even if it does, the bank had plenty of reasons after a year and a half and many broken promises and a million dollar debt not to accept yet more promises uh, from a party who hadn't kept any of them, didn't promise real money, uh, and had declared bankruptcy. So we think that was a, a reasonable uh, rejection, if, if we could even call it that. Other than that, Your Honors, if you have any questions for me, I'm, I'm happy to try to respond. Thank you. There are a lot of points raised by Huntington and very appropriate points. That's precisely why a hearing should have been held to determine whether Huntington did know that there was a tenant, whether Huntington had any discussions with the buyers. It's very unusual to see a home of this size go for a minimum, um, basically the, the minimum bid, slightly over that. Um, it's very common in foreclosure cases to see parties listed as unknown tenant or unknown occupant. This was a very large home. It had outbuildings and a huge extension or addition attached to the home where business was operated. We don't know. There's no evidence whether or not Huntington was aware that Northeast Ohio Electric actually operated there. Um, again, with this moving very quickly, and it may not be a significant issue whether the prosecutor was notified. I put that in there because on June 22, 2015, I called to see if they had received a motion to confirm. I thought it was a little bit unusual. That was you know, sometime after uh, shortly before it was filed, and I was told no. And Is any of this in the record? But in the form of an affidavit or your conversation with the prosecutor? Because we can't consider anything except what's in the record. Okay, I, I'm just stating I didn't make that up. There is a reason for that. But overall, there were a lot of procedural defects, and they should have been resolved by a hearing it would have been very easy to perhaps even have avoided an appeal if there was just a hearing and Northeast Ohio Electric was allowed to come into court, present evidence if they had any as to whether Huntington was aware of this. And it does seem a little bit unusual that although the lease was only filed for notice purposes May 20th of 2015, the day before the sale, that there was still something in the record that there is a party occupying this property and yet nothing was done uh, by the court to address that. I know that in a lot of these cases it simply comes down to notice the opportunity to be heard, but that's very important. Foreclosures are something that affect a lot of people, a lot of businesses, and banks want to put them through very quickly and 
admittedly, there are many borrowers that will try to delay things when they have no income or no hope of paying things back. That's okay. not the case okay. here. Okay. Based Council, on the you're out of time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. The court will take the matter under advisement. A written opinion will be issued and sent to both sides, and we will release it on our website. Thank you so much.